what movie were we watching again? Oh, I, I don't know. I, uh, I gosh, I forgot. Uh, um, Merry, uh, Merry Thanksgiving, Mister Tyler. Oh yes, we are recording this days before Thanksgiving. Yes, this Christmas uh, special. It's gonna be a marathon. Getting that video. I can't believe you agreed to do it. I'll just have to edit it on Christmas and throw it out there. Aaron, when was the last time we had you on the show? Oh, geez. Oh, shucks. I think it was uh, a Shinya Tsukamoto film. Of course it was a Shinya Tsukamoto film. Yeah, that's it's... half of what I do uh, <laughs> during my day. Uh, I, I think it was specifically the Nightmare Detective films. Yeah, Haze and uh, Nightmare Detective. Yeah, the, uh, the sequel. The trilogy um, of Tsukamoto dream movies. That's, 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 that's right. Do you want to reintroduce yourself? I, I don't know. We already did like your introduction in Tsukamoto how much uh, of an introduction did we do for you yeah I, I don't know I think I just said like you could call me whatever dumb name I used Necro whatever or you could just call me Aaron because that's what everybody calls me and we mentioned that the they can't pronounce your last name yeah was, it's uh, it's like it's a weird Croatian thing which I think I probably <laughs> said before too uh so if you guessed it good on you so uh yeah we've uh, we've come full circle we've reintroduced Aaron we're He's right back around right back <laughs> I think actually that this is the same time of year that we recorded the last one. Oh yeah, that's probably true, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it didn't come out until like March or April or something, but we definitely recorded around Christmas. Well, this will actually make you the most recurring guest on the hit YouTube podcast like series Japanophiles. And Eat that's, it, Argon Bolt. That's because uh Argon Bolt's episode was uh <laughs> us talking for two hours cut into two parts parts yeah uh that guy can talk for a long time he certainly can anyways today we are not talking about thanksgiving or shitting on argon ball as no. much as we would like to uh yeah i mean we could have a whole other podcast about that <laughs> no today we are talking about the uh one and only merry christmas mr lawrence now how many of you out there in the audience have heard about this movie uh and none of you will be raising your hand no one's heard about this movie yeah not really no it's it's insane and I guess we'll jump right into that as the uh, first bullet point is just the oddity that is this movie existing. Well, I think it's uh, it's emblematic in the way that we discovered it, which is uh, I think we had just watched Violent Cop and we're like, man, this this beat Takeshi guy. What a what a guy. And we just looked into his filmography and it's like, oh, OK, his first acting uh, gig was in, uh, you know, like 83. Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. Oh, that's that's interesting. Uh, Oshima. uh yeah. David Bowie. <laughs> yeah, that 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 was exactly it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, that's the big surprise here, is that this is a Beat Takeshi, David Bowie joint project. Yes. Uh, there's also many, many other talented people. Absolutely, including Ryuichi Sakamoto. Uh, don't want to leave him out. Yes. Uh, I can't remember the name of uh, Mr. Lawrence's uh, actor, but he is also an actor, like a, a famous he actor. He has been in a million things that I probably would have seen if I was British. Yeah. Uh, and... Of course, his name is, and I'm not just stalling while I look for it in my notes. Uh, <laughs> you could his, just like cut this whole section and, and like in one of our voices, like really off key, say his name. Oh, did I not write down his actor's name in this? Whoops. It was like Tom Matt. Oh, oh, it's Tom Conti. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I was about to guess and say Tom Matchy. Tom Matchy, the, the world famous uh, British actor, Tom Matchy. Uh, Tom Conti's great. I yes. It's weird because I always say this about Japanese names, but I'm, I hopefully am pronouncing Tom Conti right. Other there's somebody, so. some English person watching this that's gonna get really upset at me. It's Conti, idiot. Uh, this is definitely a movie which acts on like a quartet, uh, even though some of the characters kind of go up and down in, in 
importance. I think probably the character who has the least plot importance is uh, Hara, or uh, Beat Takeshi's character, but then he gets that coda at the end. Uh, the quartet of characters. We should go over them real quick, but we should Absolutely. also really introduce this movie and, and what it's about first. Uh, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, takes place in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. Uh, it's towards the end of World War II. Yeah, it's like two years from the end, I think. Yeah, and so... The events in this movie just portray the conditions in this prisoner of war camp uh, for the British, uh, the British soldier. Well, fuck, this is getting bad. <laughs> for the British shul- shit. Oh my god. British British soldiers. I didn't even know that was like a. Sea it shouldn't have film. been. No, that's incredible. Uh, it's not really about the condition of the camp, though. It's h- how would you describe this? Movie? Well, it's like a window in time. It's not about war camps or Japanese war camps. It's like we get a vertical slice of this story, which is apparently based on a true story. Uh, uh, and it's but, also based uh, on a book. The Seed and the Sower, I think. Which is why they have that line at the end of the movie. Right. The only difference is uh, uh, Mr. Lawrence is Dutch, I think, in yeah. real life. That's the only difference. <laughs> you know, I, there may be other differences, I will admit. I have not read the book. I think it would be interesting to read the book, but uh, that's yeah. besides the point. We're here right. to talk about the movie. So this <laughs> vertical slice of the story and, and the relationships between these characters and kind of their trajectories... Uh, uh, where they stand, like uh, Mr. Lawrence, uh, I'm going to call him Mr. Lawrence every time. I'll, I'll just say Lawrence because uh, that's what everybody else calls him. Uh, Lawrence has this kind of weird love-hate relationship with the Japanese because uh, he spent a lot of time there. He speaks Japanese. Yes, he is, uh, his... he is the only character that is fluent in both English and Japanese, like and this fully. puts him right in the middle. Yeah, he has to translate most of the time, uh, and he spent quite a lot of time before the war, so he has a like a great admiration for the culture, but at the same time, he has to deal with the brutalities of these camps and their conditions uh, on a day-to-day basis. So the Japanese kind of treat him like a a milksop because he's like uh, one line, why didn't you kill yourself? You seem like a good person. Yeah, yeah. Honor is definitely something that uh, plays into it, and we'll talk about that later, but he is basically bullied by both his own men and the Japanese for the same reason, but in very different ways, just because he's the only one that's kind of trying to get everybody to get along. He's the only one that is really like, okay, we're in this, or actually he's one of two characters, I would say, that knows that the rules right now don't apply. But for Lawrence, he says like, oh, well, the cultural barriers that we've put up need to be broken down. We're all stuck in this horrible situation. Yeah. So we should all try to get along with it. And that's his approach to this. Right. I think also what you brought up was um, the conditions in this uh, prisoner of war camp. And before we get too far into actually talking about the movie, I think what's really interesting is that Mr. Lawrence is a war movie without a war. And it is also a prison movie without really having a prison. Yeah, not particularly. They have a house that Mm. they uh, hang in. And that's pretty much occasionally like once or twice throughout the movie, they're confined to the house and they're not allowed to leave. But yeah, there's no real prison it's a it's a camp yes. some of the people uh do work but a lot of the characters are officers so they're not really expected to do work in that way a lot of their interactions with the japanese officers that are detaining them are really like light-hearted uh not all the time yeah but, well yeah. i think it's because a lot of the japanese officers are so young there's the one who who comes in because major Sellers is missing and and he's no i gotta report it i gotta report that he's gone it's like no no he's he's here he's here somewhere please don't don't raise a huge shit storm right now yeah that's the thing and what makes uh mr lawrence uh, very interesting. You'll you'll have characters on both sides saying, well, why are the Japanese doing that? Or why are the Americans doing this? Mm-hmm. And Lawrence is the only character that will really go up to one side, pat them on the shoulder and say, well, this is their custom. And this, this puts him in it. an awkward position when these two sides are still technically at war with each other. And this is still the enemy to both of them. We should mention two characters. One okay. of them extremely briefly because he is not technically 
technically part of the quartet, but he is a important Hinkley. character nonetheless. Uh, is Captain Hixley? Hixley, Hixley. That's right. I thought it was. Yeah. Hinkley. Yeah. Hixley, which is uh just the epitome of stuffy upper class British. He's got a line in the movie which I I just noticed for the first time. This is my third time watching it. I think uh, where he he goes, yeah. Well, what school did you go to? And then he walks off. And he's like, <laughs> Lawrence is just, where do you think you are? Hixley is the perfect counterpoint because when you have a character like Lawrence that is trying to show both sides that they don't really need to be fighting with each other right now, even though one is detaining the other, yeah. uh, Hixley is the counterpoint where he's almost staunchly in the role of the prisoner. He it brings up the Geneva Convention multiple times times as if the Japanese officers are going to stop what they're doing just because right. of the the rules of war. He really upholds the conventions of war in that yeah. there's a way that these things go about and there's a way that these things are supposed to be done. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he's just uh, out of his element, really, in this kind of war camp. And, and there's a couple times where they say, this is not Europe. You're not in a German prisoner camp. You gotta act different here. He is kind of endearing in his own way even though he's yeah. not one of the major players and not one that we really get a full look at but he serves his purpose if you didn't have him there you wouldn't have that sort of uh other authoritarian counterpoint to the japanese authoritary but his major foil also lawrence's foil in a way yeah. the the counterbalance to hicksley is lieutenant hara played oh by a good friend beat Takeshi. Oh, man. It's just, you hear stories about uh, how he was disappointed when it aired in Japan because he was primarily known as a comedian and some people saw the movie and like laughed at some of his scenes because they just couldn't get it out of his head. I feel really badly about that because he does such a good job in this movie. Oh, yeah. I th completely forgot to uh, even bring it up. This is an early beat Takeshi. Yeah, this is, absolutely. This is before Violent Cop? Yes, like almost, I think like 10 years before Violent yeah, Cop. Yeah, like way before he had that image. Uh, yeah, Hara is great, and Hara is, is like, on the surface, he looks like the shit kicker, like the the the, the hard ass in the looks camp. Like but he's like, Takeshi. yeah. He's a little more nuanced. He's the sort of dude who, like, drinks with Lawrence. I don't know. It's it's hard to describe. Yanoi is, is stuffier. Hara is a bit hard to pin down at first. Yeah. But there's a couple scenes that start to give him away. One of my favorite ones is where he's talking to Lawrence. Uh, and I forget how the topic comes up exactly. But he asks if Lawrence is a queer. Mm -hmm. And Lawrence is like, no, no, we don't have queers in our army. And then... And uh, uh, Hara is just like, you know, if we had queers in our army, we would own up to having queers in our army. We don't we don't hate that. <laughs> yeah. About... Samurai don't fear queers is his line. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, no matter what Lawrence was going to say, Hara was probably going to say the opposite right there. Yeah. Uh, it does make for some nice foreshadowing, but we'll uh, we'll get to that later on. Uh, yeah. Hara also has that scene towards the beginning where he actually gets chewed out by Yanoi, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of interesting because he's it, you can see like uh, all of a sudden he all of his power is stripped away from him and he's having to make excuses like oh this is why I didn't report this this is why I just had this guy commit suicide over stealing yeah. some bananas. Well, when you think about things from Hara's perspective most of the time when he does things like that he, he does do them as a mercy mm -hmm. from what his perspective is the the best thing for that person so at the beginning he gives uh Kanemoto I think the that opportunity to so minor that I would never have corrected you or even known his name <laughs> <laughs> uh the 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 man who begins the sordid series of events kanemoto uh he gives him the opportunity to kill himself uh but he gives him the opportunity privately uh so that it, it's easier on his family uh but then uh down the line when kanemoto is actually killing himself uh and the the dude who's in charge of being his second is does like get up get up get up so i can behead you get up come on don't be weak oh yeah uh hara just like 
walks over, like knocks the dude down and beheads him on the spot. But it's just, it's a mercy. Yeah. He's a merciful man, despite his hard uh, appearance, his uh, hard outer shell. Similar to Hicksley, he's also just completely steeped in his own idea of the 100%. And, yeah. yeah, and honor. Uh, and to him, a lot of the ritual suicide stuff still makes sense. Uh, it's This is the honorable way to own up to your mistakes. From his just, perspective, he gave up his life the moment he joined the army. Yeah, entirely. It's not even his life to offer, right? And what I think is really funny, but also kind of makes his character work, is that it's Lieutenant Hara. He's still not like the big dog, but he, no. when no other uh, authority is around, Hara, like, uh, he grabs all of that authority or, you know, he, uh, yeah. he beefs himself up, like, completely because to him, he's now the authority. He's still going about these rules as if they really still apply in this situation as if these aren't all just people which is a recurring theme of this movie of course yeah uh should we move on to let me i think yanoi was i think we should save selliers for last yes yes of course yeah Uh, that's actually Uh, how the movie introduces them too pretty much yeah uh yanoi is interesting so i want to immediately make a comparison uh yes i was actually gonna make this comparison to um his name it just completely invokes yo noid 2 the video game (laughs) it's entirely intentional oh my god oh god yeah i didn't even know ah this changes everything yo noid yo noid (laughs) anyways so captain you uh and hara have uh backstories that can be compared in an interesting way, I think. So Hara is a kind of a simple man. When the war started, he went to a shrine, he signed up, and that was that. Like, his story is short and sweet. Uh, he did what he was supposed to do. Yeah. Yunoi has this whole, like, stinging regret and brooding backstory that he couldn't be present during the uh, the December uprising, I think. Yeah, it's the um, military coup uh, yeah. in Japan. The, the shining young men or whatever it was. Uh, the, a bunch of of uh, idealistic lieutenants tried to overthrow the government in the name of the emperor because uh, they believed that the emperor's uh, people were misleading him, like guiding him uh, away from the best interests of the nation. This is not the first time this has happened in Japan. Not even close. <laughs> No, uh, but he was in Manchuria, so he was unable to participate and all of his people, he was like one of them, but he just, he couldn't help. He wanted to die with them. And because of that, he's kind of carries that around as this kind of doom almost. Well, what I thought was interesting was it's almost like to him, he's already broken the rules. He's already sort of not done what he's supposed to do. And that's yeah. horrible for him. Like he can't really live with it. He's got all these... Uh, uh, paradoxes inside of him that are tearing him up that then leads into his interactions with jack who ends up being a very important and interesting character to yanoi straight for jack sellers <laughs> straight for uh, i love that scene where lawrence and yanoi are talking and uh lawrence is trying to explain how to translate <laughs> Strafer. yeah that line that he has that's like it's remarkably hard to do this sometimes <laughs> yeah uh, as somebody that's been learning Japanese <laughs> like I've had moments where doing the opposite has been like you know the, the Japanese equivalent would be um um I I got no fucking clue mm-hmm. <laughs> anything else we want to say on Yanoi by himself I don't think so only that like it's it's a very interesting quintessential difference between Yanoi and uh, Hara yeah uh, where Hara is somebody of a lower rank that is more steeped in the rules Yanoi, because, you know, to him, the the rules have already been bent or he's, he's already missed his chance to really live up to his role. Yeah. He, he's kind of willing to bend them a little bit more for his own personal reasons. And that, to Yanoi, ends up being a weakness for him. Yeah. And who was he played by, Aaron? Ryuichi Sakamoto. And what did he do? Uh, He played music. He, he played the music, music for the movie. He also played the music for the movie, yes. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, fantastic 
fantastic score, by the way. Uh, great. Look it up. It's on Spotify. This is as good a time as any to talk about the score because, holy shit, this, like, people don't know this movie. People might know the score. Uh, yeah, a couple songs from this movie showed up in a movie called The Fault in, Fault in Your Stars or Fault in Our Stars or whatever. Oh, it's like really? kind of a weird romance. Uh, yeah. That's a fucking John Green book, isn't it? Is it? I thought so. Maybe. John Green that... I don't book. know. I only... <laughs> I only know I uh, I was looking up the uh, the soundtrack once and uh, it appeared in a couple different places. Well, the main theme was also like re-released as a single with some uh, vocal tracks on it. Yeah. Uh, and from what I heard it, around the time, it just became much more popular than the actual movie, which is ironic. Yeah, that's how it goes. Yeah. Uh, it shares a similar fate of the Tarzan soundtrack where people go, oh, that's from a movie? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I don't know the last time time i've talked about disney's tarzan with oh anyone yeah. it's been a been about a week for me except in relation to the kingdom hearts games maybe <laughs> fucking there's the merry <laughs> christmas mr lawrence world oh man wouldn't that be great just like donald and goofy are tied up to stakes and they're being beaten bashed over the head with uh bamboo sticks uh, okay okay aaron uh i was thinking that like donald goofy sora and jack skeleton could team up with uh oh lawrence and uh, you know solve some uh, uh, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Whoa. crazy aaron we'll move on to our last character and probably Probably the reason that both me and you were most excited to see this movie. Absolutely. The prospect of a beat Takeshi film uh, that also has David Bowie in it, even though that's not actually what it is really. Uh, yeah. David this, Bowie plays Jack Sellers. This is the crossover that I never knew I wanted to happen and still technically hasn't happened and unfortunately will never happen because David Bowie is not really playing directly opposite uh, beat Takeshi, but it, no, regardless, they don't interact much. regardless, David Bowie is one of the highlights of this movie. David Bowie is fantastic. He's almost like your archetypical like mystery gunman, but not in a Western film. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not even really mystery by the end of it. No, not by the end of it, but like his whole shtick when he comes in and he's he's just this kind of aloof, uh, charming, like he's got all these mannerisms. He's, like when he's being brought to be executed at the start of the film, he goes through this whole pantomime of uh, starting his morning. I love love that yeah <laughs> it's so good when he eats the flowers too. oh yeah it, it's like he's at that point he's so detached from everything he's just playing into uh the officer's uh, superstitions about him has david bowie ever talked about this movie i have seen interviews that were entirely in japanese oh geez. That, but I, so it's it's like uh four japanese people are talking about the movie and then one of them like turns to david bowie and asks a question and <laughs> the answers and then they go back to the Japanese people and then David Bowie goes oh yes yeah oh yeah quite yeah. liked it quite liked the film I liked it <laughs> David Bowie is the highlight of this movie he's the real main character yeah in a way you know it's one of those secondary main character things where the point of view is definitely Lawrence but yeah all of the plot kind of hinges on Jack the movie is definitely about Lawrence witnessing what happens to Jack Sellers yeah yeah it's uh Jack story as told by Lawrence. So uh, I think one of the best shots in the movie early on is uh, Stelliers is being tried in a court. Uh, he's been captured. Uh, he was leading some uh, people in, I, I believe, Jabba uh, to fight the, the Japanese. Yes, Jabba the Hutt, uh, battling that dastardly Hutt warlord. Uh, that mummy fuck. <laughs> he was captured alone and they're they're grilling him. They're asking him all these questions. But when they walk him into the courtroom, there's Captain and Yanoi and Yanoi sees him and you get this this like background piano track it, and a it's slow an fade scene. in on his yeah. face everything else fades out as the camera zooms in on Yanoi and as an audience without anything changing hands like yeah. without any narration or anything you realize that Yanoi has just uh, I don't want to say fallen in love but you, I think you, that he's fallen in love with uh, David Bowie he sees David Bowie Bowie in his, in his full like uh, Afrikaner uh, gear and uh, he just falls in love. 
Well, I think what is kind of amazing about this movie is that it has like all of this homoerotic subtext. You can even read it between Hara and uh, Lawrence to some degree if you really yeah. put those goggles on. Uh, but it's not a gay movie. It's not a like, oh, we're going to represent the LGBT community with this movie or anything. Like, you know, nah. being attracted to David Bowie is just as incidental as the entire world being attracted to David Bowie because that's well, correct. The only big like connection or i guess analysis at all of of any gay themes have to do with uh the kind of micro plot going on underneath with kanemoto and the uh, dutch soldier and and that kind of pushing things forward with the plot and then the macro plot of course is uh Yanoi has these weird feelings that he can't put to words quite and then he's throughout the movie he is arranging things in such a way that he can be closer to Selliers. Included with these weird feelings is also the fact that he's doing these things that would not be considered he's not considering Jack as a prisoner anymore yeah. which is entirely against what Hara is is trying to, you know, instate at the uh, prison uh, to some degree. Eventually, later in the movie, it changes, but, you know. Yeah. Like, y Yanoi is viewing Jack as a person, and that's not good for somebody that needs to run this camp that uh, is intending to dehumanize these people. Right. And, Has to dehumanize and, them in order for it to function as a war camp. Yeah, and so, like, then you get people close to Yanoi saying, like, oh, this, this guy, he's a devil, he's yeah he's evil he's poisoning he's possessed your heart. our captain yeah <laughs> i like jack just becomes so part of the mythology of this camp almost the day that he enters in like yeah he's this uh jesus figure that's going to save everybody in the camp and stuff when he first comes in you know there's mm -hmm. like uh british soldiers whispering like oh wow you know th th did you hear jack sellier's coming in oh my god whoa he's he's Who the is this mad yeah exactly <laughs> in terms of uh, Selliers, I noticed something in this watch through that I hadn't really noticed the first couple times through, which is that Selliers' backstory is very perspective based. It's really it's not, lame. <laughs> it's not. It's definitely not lame. <laughs> Okay, I when I say it's really lame, yeah, I and I did want to bring this up as a point. Sure, uh, was that the movie is kind of builds up all of this like oh like oh what's going on? He you know he's this kind of like mysterious this, rogue, right? Yeah. Uh, and before we get too far into that, I do think we should mention his sort of counterpoint to Lawrence because I think Jack is the only other character that for him the rules are kind of gone. For Lawrence, the rules are gone, and he just wants both sides to get along and come together. For yeah. Jack, the rules are gone and he will be as defiant as he can be without getting himself killed. Right. Uh, and even that point, getting himself killed, uh, not necessarily... <laughs> Yes. He's like, he, he's yeah. definitely got a Thanatos drive going. He's probably the only prisoner that ends up acting in direct opposition of the Japanese captors. Yeah, very and, casually. Yeah, very casually in a very David Bowie way. He feeds the uh, troops when they're supposed to be on a f uh, fasting because they were not respectful during the uh, ritual suicide of a Japanese soldier. He convinces the, tr uh, the troops to sing. Uh, uh, in order to honor their fallen comrade who uh, ended up they have been expressly forbidden to do expressly forbidden to do because no one was supposed to know that guy was dead because uh, the Japanese viewed all this as a sign of weakness right uh, and so he's he's a real instigator and I think the funny part is that like as much as Hicksley uh, ends up talking the talk and like oh, I'm the big macho soldier man right yeah uh, Jack is the actual person that that's doing all this like defiance of a of the authority mm -hmm. like whenever Hicksley opens his mouth it's always to reaffirm like you can't do this to us we're prisoners right right <laughs> like, he's just he's, he's very like impotent he's really comfortable in this role that gives him no authority or agency or anything <laughs> but he yeah damn if he doesn't want to just stay in it because he just he falls that's probably what his role outside of this war camp was was just fall in line follow orders yeah yeah that's almost what a good certainly. soldier does and the second that something changes like uh you know i wants to put the attractive jack in place of hicksley right. then he gets all 
huffy puffy and he gets oh well you know this isn't right i can do the job better than him and, and stuff like that yeah it, little does he realize that literally anybody can do the job it's not much of a job it's not much of a job it's just the ambassador from the troops to the uh, japanese soldiers and so he he holds on to this position of authority that anyone can do yeah uh, because that's all that he knows i bring all this up because it kind of builds this mystery and mythology around jack and then we get to his backstory Right. And for me, his backstory wasn't, I guess, underwhelming because through the camera work and the music and everything, mm -hmm. you understand the weight of it. Yeah. But it was much more mundane than you're ever expecting it to be. Well, it's much more mundane even than the story that Lawrence tells immediately before. Yes. Oh, and that's another great scene, too. Yeah. Lawrence, uh, whereas with Sellier's, uh, you get a full flashback. Lawrence is just like sitting there telling a story about the girl he met when the war broke out and what happened to her and he's it's just a uh, straight up on his face and then at the end he's like i don't want to talk about this anymore that's uh the whole scene's fantastic just the music playing during it and you know uh, uh fucking tom conti whether yeah. or not we're pronouncing that right uh he really sells that that whole scene yeah now uh sell your story to very cliff notes it is essentially that when he was young he wasn't a very good brother to his brother and uh uh, an event happened which made his uh, younger brother kind of lose his smile a little bit. Like his brother was a uh, uh, sang, and and he was he was just a very nice, bright, shining young boy. And then because of the events that he allowed to happen, the way that his brother's life progressed, he just became a farmer. He gave up on his dreams, all that. Now this all sounds very, uh, or it sounds more dramatic the way you're putting it. Yeah, the thing that I noticed because the first time I watched through, I thought that it was a little a little weird mm. weirdly muted but this time through i've noticed uh for instance so when they age them up and they're both in school that's david a bowie weird looks choice. like david bowie the kid is still the kid yeah right? that's because of the perspective it's the issue is that he never stopped seeing his brother as a child ah. that's not what the brother looked like because then you go to the flashback at the end where he's lying there uh spoilers dying and he's thinking about his life and he's thinking about his brother and he imagines this scenario where he walks through the garden with his younger brother as he is now with his younger brother as he was then singing and it's it's like he gets to find respite in this fantasy uh but that's what it always was because he made it to be a much bigger thing than it was his brother probably never thought about that again because of how he saw it it became this thing that just drove him and uh i think we should be a little bit more explicit about what happens uh yeah. his his brother is a good singer but is always picked on by kids right when they go to private school eventually the young Younger brother follows David Bowie into private school, uh, you know, like a year or two behind or whatever. Mm -hmm. And Jack ends up standing by and watching as a bunch of kids bully his little brother because I think he's really just afraid about like how that reflects on him, how his brother being this, you know, weakling in his right. in his words reflects on him. And he's almost like sick uh, or the way he, when he says it, uh, he says something like, I couldn't stand that there wasn't something that was wasn't completely perfect about me and he yeah. sounds like sick with himself uh, yeah you know it's clear that he doesn't look back on this and say like oh yeah fuck my brother or whatever. he's like wow yeah i was a fucking bitch <laughs> mm -hmm. that's like he became a lawyer he had a fairly successful lawyer but like when the war started he immediately went off because he's got this whole death drive from from this event from from how big he made it for the the magnitude that he inserted into it and there you can almost draw a parallel to Yanoi. Yes, exactly. With the uh, coup and his backstory. Yeah, right. They have that in common where they've they've both taken this event, which is not, you know, I mean, like, sure, it's a dick thing to do, but to, like, don't throw your life away for yeah. it. Yeah. I'm, I'm and I mean, sure with the, uh, with the coup, years, the yeah. whole idea is, like, you, you don't have to feel bad about not throwing your life away. Yeah. So, we're set up now. One of these two, Yanoi or Lawrence, is going to die that night because why Aaron why because uh they found a radio they found a radio snuck into a tent yes that was it <laughs> yeah. thank you oh uh, did you forget 
A little bit. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's because it's such a, it is a a relatively minor thing, but basically, uh, it's it's snuck in. They don't know who it could be. Like they have no guesses, so they're like, but well, we as the maybe... audience know that it was Jack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, because Jack doesn't care. He yeah. just he like is explicitly like he just does whatever. Oh, and so... then this characterizes you know I perfectly. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. they uh they find this radio and you know I is talking with Lawrence, trying to get Lawrence to confess to bring in the radio and eventually Lawrence breaks down and says well what do you want me to say I didn't take it I'm not going to name a name of anybody that took it then Lawrence says would you rather there just be somebody punished than have a crime go completely unsolved and you know I says yes yes you point. understand thank you for he even he the way he phrases it is like thank you for understanding yeah he doesn't like, he doesn't uh, get that Lawrence is just fed up with him <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that this isn't Lawrence like coming to understand his ways. This, this is Lawrence scene, saying what this the scene fuck? is. Uh, Lawrence has just been uh, thrashed. He can barely walk, and he sits down, kneels down next to Yanoi and Hara, and Hara is saying funeral rites, like mm -hmm. Buddhist funeral rites. And uh, after he's been told, he starts just like thrashing the room. He asks Hara if he thinks this is this is like this is a samurai bushido. Like he's pulled out of the room, and that's that leads into the scene with. Uh, Lawrence and Selliers telling their stories. Yeah, and that scene's fantastic. Uh, we went through Absolutely. it. But... Yeah. So then they're being taken away from their cells. One of them has to die that night. It's yeah. either Jack or it's either Lawrence. And they see one of the sweetest things in the movie, a beat Takeshi drunk off his ass. On sake. On sake. Oh, yeah. And this is where we get the title. This is where we get... Uh, one of the most heartwarming moments in the movie when mm. uh, Lieutenant Hara lets both of them go. They're free to live and go back to the camp. And he uh, calls himself Father Christmas. Yeah. And of course, then says, Merry Christmas. Lawrence. Well, the way he does it, he like he shouts out Lawrence. <laughs> I know that it's partially because I've seen the rest of Beat Takeshi's filmography. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a great moment in the movie, too. But, like, holy shit, watching it this time, uh, uh, watching it for the second time. Yeah. Uh, I I did get, like, teary-eyed. I was so like, did I. Oh, shit. So did I. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Takeshi. <laughs> this, is, this is too good. Uh, that's the uh, happiest you'll ever see Beat Takeshi in any movie. I think so, yeah. Ever. Uh, except maybe, uh, what, uh... Kikujiro? Kikujiro, yeah. No, even then, he's kind of a sad sack throughout. Yeah, he's, he's definitely pretty grumpy. Like, he's a grumpy old man that yeah. has to get this kid to, uh, bet on horses for him. <laughs> get him somewhere. Anyways, so that leads into, uh... Well, actually, so before we move on, I'd like to ask, in your opinion, why do you think that... Hara in his drunken state let them go? That's a good question because yeah. like we said, Hara's really hard to pin down. Just when you yeah. think you have him pinned down as like, I'm always going to follow the rules. I'm the guy in charge right now and, you know, the honorable thing to do is die and not dishonor your country or your family. Right. He then, you know, lets them go in this scene, which isn't like, uh, I don't know, it's gonna seem weird on your first watch through and it's probably still gonna seem weird after i don't think i have a concrete answer but mm -hmm. the the bits and pieces that you get is really just that like hara is doing this for lawrence that yeah. whatever weird friendship that they've forged and whatever cultural things that lawrence has been trying to impart to hara has finally gotten through and that's why hara is finally breaking down some of his own like persona the, yeah the persona he's built up and letting both of them go i think that it serves a good role in just 
just in terms of the story of the movie as well. Because and you the get, alcohol uh, helps too. Yes. Oh, definitely. You get this from the man who has been built up to be the law-obsessed, Bushido honor-obsessed shit kicker. Uh, not from the, you know, like the warrior poet, Yanoi. Yeah, yeah. He, this brusque, kind of brutal man. Uh, if is it the happened one from that, Yanoi, you, it wouldn't have the same effect. No, absolutely not. Uh, now we want to move into the last section. The, the finale, yeah. Uh, the finale. So Yanoi is pissed, obviously, because he doesn't get his easy out. He doesn't, he's not freed from his feelings. Earlier in the movie, there's a confrontation between uh, Yanoi and Selliers, where uh, Selliers has stolen a knife. Yanoi draws a sword. Uh, they're getting ready to fight, and Selliers just drops the knife. He's like, eh, I'm not doing that. Yeah, and it's almost like in that moment, Yanoi was like, oh, finally, I oh, can. You could free me. Free I, me from this. Uh, yeah, either I can die honorably or I can kill you and not have to worry about this weird mixed up feeling of like feeling for the enemy. Yeah. And, you know, he drops the sword and he's like, no, wait, what are you doing? This is wrong. You're mm -hmm. you're not doing this right. This is not how it's supposed to be. His line is, if you beat me, you could be free. Yeah. But you almost exactly. hear it like, if we fought, I could be free. So, you know, he's pissed. And I think at that at this point, he is doubling down on the aspects that he's been weaker on because yeah. he demands that all the soldiers get out there. They get him out. Yeah. And then he's like, where are all the sick ones? Yeah. He's like, that's the what Hicksley has a point when he brings up the uh, the Geneva Convention then because it's <laughs> yeah, all right. And they roll out a bunch of people missing legs on crutches like and people die on the way there. Yeah. Like just moving them a, a total of maybe 30 feet that completely kills at least one person. Yeah. And then you see him uh, laying out some Gatling guns and a uh, chopping block. And obviously things are about to go quite badly. Yeah. Because, you know, for, you know, this is him. He's made his first mistake in not dying for the coup. Yeah. But now like that someone under his command has let uh, this crime go unpunished. It now means that he's made this mistake mistake again he hasn't lived up to the code again and he needs to crack down on it he needs to uh you know actually double down on being the captain in charge and yeah and he's on like culture. at this stage uh sakamoto is doing a fantastic job portraying someone on the verge of a nervous breakdown yes yes he is uh yeah from there the sick guys come out and yanoi and uh jack have their whole confrontation well, Sellers has just had enough at this stage he's he's just like he's completely resigned he sees what's happened he sees what's happening he knows how uh Yanoi feels about him at that stage he walks up to Yanoi seizes him by the shoulders and kisses both of his cheeks clear act of defiance uh, like Yanoi is left with no option either to a embrace uh David Bowie which I mean who wouldn't want to but at the same time it's never going to happen yeah uh <laughs> how many times if I said that. <laughs> Not many anymore. Anyways, uh, so, but the other option, of course, is this officer just came up and kissed me. I have to kill him. I have to make That's an example it. out of him. Otherwise, all of this, all of this, uh, all of these social uh, constructs that we have in the prison have broken down. All of these constructs that the movie has been putting at like, it, it's been bending them so much. Mm -hmm. They're they're going to break entirely if he doesn't kill Jack right there yeah. or execute him. And so, so he does. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They, they build a sand pit, they dig a hole, they put cellars in it, and they fill him up to the head and they, he just suffocates. They fill him up to the, the neck. Eventually there's a scene where uh, he's almost died. It's it's night, and uh, Yanoi walks in and like grabs a piece of his hair and like cuts it off and like puts it in a uh, napkin. I think at uh, that point, Yanoi's been freed too. Yeah. He, he and he salutes Jack. Yeah. Like through this act of defiance, Yanoi has finally kind of come to terms with his own personal issues and mm -hmm. it, his own sort of things, and Jack has as well. Uh, yeah. Despite you know being dead and shit. No. 
no, he works it out in his in his head as he uh, slowly dies. Yeah, and the scene where he uh, where you know he salutes Jack, it's uh, that's another really moving scene. Uh, and yeah. the movie quite literally just ends on that. I mean, like the main story that yeah, it just immediately stops. You don't. Do, it's not important to know how the American POWs were either shipped back or rescued. There's not even like a, a voiceover that says, "Oh, and then this happened" or whatever. Wouldn't that have been awful? That would have been. Terrible. That would have been the worst. It's a good thing as a good director in charge. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing during the flashback sequence because there's a bit of a voiceover at the beginning and a bit at the end. Yeah. And but like throughout the rest of it, you get the entire idea with very minimal leading. Mm-hmm. This is very well directed. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Nagisa Oshima, I yes. believe. Uh, I have not seen any of his other films. I want to watch uh, Taboo. Really? Oh, his that's last the one? movie. I have not seen any of his films either, uh, much like Tom Conti. <laughs> we should talk about the coda. The coda. Uh, so how much do we want to talk? Because I don't know to what degree you can do it justice by mentioning it. It's oh, one of what? the best scenes in any movie. Uh, I think at the very least, we should mention that at the coda, the roles have been completely completely reversed between Hara yeah. and Lawrence. Yeah, now Hara is the uh, prisoner and uh, Lawrence is uh, not the captor, but he is uh, in a position of authority over him. And sure. Lawrence is also stuck in a very similar position of having to carry out orders and yeah. not being able to change orders. There's nothing he could do about it. And like, Hara is just very placid about it because, well, you know, he's a samurai, right? Mm-hmm. That's uh, an interesting thing is that Hara even says beat Takeshi says in English yeah uh, you and I were both doing the same thing we were following this like the same orders how did it end up like this yeah and Lawrence really doesn't have an answer for him no because I don't he think says, anybody uh, does war is not fair no uh yeah uh, but I mean that kind of sums up the theme of the movie in general absolutely Just two different cultures doing the same thing completely differently and the conflicts that end up happening because of it I I think watching this movie through a second time really hammered through a lot of the thematic elements that the movie was playing up. Mm-hmm. One of the best uh, s- like musical stings at the end of the final scene leading into the credits. One but of the again, best lines. Um, one of the best. It's so good. It's like it's that scene ties it all together so well. If I was tearing up at the middle of this movie, then I was crying at the end. Yeah. No. <laughs> every time I've gotten gotten like pretty pretty emotionally involved. Do you think somebody would get as emotionally involved if they hadn't seen Beat Takeshi movies? I think so, yeah. Because I know for me, a huge part of it is Beat Takeshi's performance in both those scenes and just, you know, uh, knowing him as an actor from other yeah. things and almost just equating this as a catharsis for uh, different Beat Takeshi characters that have died because that is yeah. a thing he does a lot in movies. Most of his films. Uh, so Roger Ebert said that uh, because this movie is both in Japanese and English. It's very hard to comprehend what's going on, and it's a piece of shit. Give it That's two out of four. Not quite exactly what he said. I still think that <laughs> what he said was wrong, but essentially he compared the English style of acting, which goes for a more realistic, uh, like pretending like you're there, to the Japanese style of acting, which is very exaggerated. Uh, and that's true, but I don't think that it's a problem in this movie. I don't think it's even close to a problem in this movie. Partly, I think, because uh, most of the time, the Japanese characters are speaking in Japanese uh, and the English characters are speaking English. The only character that needs to do both is Lawrence. Right. Um, and the rest, I, you could really just call like cultural different. Of course, they, they act differently. Uh, that's just to further cement this this difference in these uh, two cultures. He's acting like, uh, like one person's doing like a Bugs Bunny voice and that sets the scene off it's uh, he's definitely being hyperbolic for that it's, i think they're just this movie ended up getting looked over by a lot of people which is weird because david bowie but is it because david bowie war film doesn't fit together is, is that it i don't know i i'm not sure i i do think that today the people who have seen it like it i think generally speaking yeah. it has achieved a cult following but it's definitely very like underseen i i uh before i knew about this movie i had obviously seen a 
lot of Japanese films. I had also been a massive fan of David Bowie for years. I knew nothing about it. Zero. Yeah. Uh, I think it's kind of amazing how far under the radar this movie flew, uh, for both of us at least. And even, like you say, it has a cult following, but I think a lot of, like, yes, Could it be I, that I would agree. We started the cult following? Yes, we us are. Us and least. our friends? <laughs> we are a third of the cult following. Yeah. Uh, the the thing is, though, like, because it's such a serious movie about, you know, war and, and cultural differences and, and, you know, it's a heavy, heavy movie. It mm-hmm. It's never going to achieve that, like, oh, cult movie. People are going to watch this as, like, a leisure fun thing. Yeah. It's I definitely... mean, it's not, it doesn't need to. No. But I think that might also contribute to people just not knowing about it. It would be probably pretty emotionally exhausting if I watched the movie a lot. Yeah. Like I I could just throw on Tetsuo any day and it's fine. Uh, But yeah, uh, I think also uh, that people don't realize that it's not, it's not like come and see. It's not a traumatic war film. It's not like where, where it's the bomb shells exploding and like ear ringing. It's, it's a very quiet, moody film. It's a war film without any war. Right. As you said at the beginning. Yes. uh, Tying it back. It's yeah. And I think it's so interesting that both, both the war element and the camp element are so underplayed because if they weren't, then this would be a completely different movie. Yeah. This would just be any run of the mill, like war is bad, a eh? sort of things. It's definitely, I think the fact that it is a character based movie mm-hmm. and not a plot based movie, really. Uh, of course there is a plot and it's uh, interesting to follow, but it's, it's really about that quartet. It's completely driven by the characters and yeah, by plot, plot-based movie you mean it's not like a well point a to b to c right it's not like d. bridge over the river kwai to yeah. give a uh a somewhat similar example of english people in a japanese war camp so real quick aaron lightning round uh you get to pick one ryuchi sakamoto or mm-hmm. chui shikawa go oh fuck uh Ch- chui shikawa ah <laughs> that's it <laughs> Uh, yeah, so who would you recommend Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, to? God, I like uh, almost anybody, actually. I, I think that this you is, could this is get the this broadest movie we will recommend here on Japan. Honestly, Fantasy. really, like it's not it's not a, a Sukamoto film, it's not like purely on the visuals, it's not like a fucking Sono Shion film where it's got all this weird culty shit. It's just, I'd show like my parents this, I think. I, think I would like- probably show my parents this if not. I will show my parents this yeah. at some point. I think just having David Bowie in it kind of piques people's curiosity. Absolutely, right? It's the same reason that we got into uh I think most people uh, would. Wasn't enough for the general public. Not in 1983. I, as far as I would recommend it too, yeah, just a very general audience for this one, yeah. which is kind of interesting. Uh, obviously, you know, people that are willing to watch a character-driven war film without any action, that's yeah. a hurdle, but David Bowie will sell them on it. I think so. I think so. All right. Anything else you want to add? Uh, nope. All right. Then I just have one thing to say to you, Aaron. Okay. Merry Christmas, Mr. Aaron. <laughs>